And thanks for keeping, you know, the the conversation going globally about entrepreneurship and startups and the cultural and economic impact that we we can all have during these strange times. And Brad, I mean, you and I go way back. Way back. Way back. <laughs> and uh, to your Boulder Birkenstock wearing days. Back, back, back before entrepreneurship was trendy. Yeah, exactly. And that, you know, I kind of want, I don't know, I'm, I know that you're kind of a global superstar, but you've done a lot of important work, not just as a VC or as a startup guru and an author, um, but also like with Techstars. I mean, you co-founded Techstars before there were any accelerators, before it was a saturated market for, for incubators and startups. And you really at Techstars kind of released you know, opened up the floodgates, you know, for what it was to become. And I just wanted to, to know your perspective, um, you know, ver versus where you started with Techstars and the, the startup incubator model to where, how maybe that perspective has changed over the years and looking at how you've rolled out different programs around the, the globe. Yeah, I think, uh, I think to answer that, um, there's, there's two layers in the question. One is, is kind of the how, but the other is also the why. Mm -hmm. And I, I think the why, at least from my frame of reference, is important because I think it's a problem in uh, the evolution of entrepreneurship uh, today where I think less people are focused on the why of what they're doing versus yeah. just doing something. Um, and for me, fundamentally, the why is so important. Um, especially as an investor or entrepreneur, but especially evaluating what entrepreneurs are doing and what the motivations are. This stuff takes a long time. It's incredibly hard. It fails a lot. Um, you know, every successful company I've been involved in has multiple near-death experiences. Um, you know, the wrong decisions at different points in time send things off in one direction. The right decisions might send it off in a different direction, but you can't predict any of that stuff in advance. So I, as I've gotten older, I become more fascinated with the why of different things. I'm in my mid fifties. And so I'm sort of, you know, in that, in that stage of life where uh, doing it just to do it uh, is no longer that interesting. And so when I go back in time and look, I started my first company in 1987 and I just didn't know any better. Like, it, you know, I, the, my why was I didn't really want to work for anybody. I had some interesting ideas. I was super into computers. Um, and, you know, we constructed specific things that we were excited about. But, you know, in my early uh, 20s, it was like, well, this is a thing to do. And this is a way to do it. And why not? Uh, as, as I've fast forwarded from 87 to the mid 90s, I sold that first business in the mid 90s. And between 1994 and 96, I made 40 angel investments with the money that I made from selling that company, all small, $25,000, $50,000 investments. And it was at the very beginning of the rise of the commercial internet. And many of those investments were internet related investments. And at this moment in time, my why was a function of a couple of things. One was personal, which um, I, I, I was a good CEO, but I didn't love being a CEO and I wanted to be involved in lots of companies. And so I viewed sort of co-founding companies and being an angel investor as a way to get there. Um, but I also was like, I would say many people at the beginning of the rise of the commercial internet, a deep, deep believer that this was transformative uh, over a long period of time for our society. That was 25 years ago. And I think that links to the today question because today it's undeniable that the internet has been transformative on our species. And in a lot of ways, the COVID crisis uh, amplified and accelerated things in a really significant way. I, I believe that we just had three to five years of innovation, uh, acceleration, not new technology innovation, just acceleration of stuff that already was there things that were already happening, collapse of incumbent companies, um, collapse of uh, incumbent behavior because of the effects of COVID and the dynamics. And a simple example, of course, is video conferencing like this. Um, another, another simple example is telemedicine. 
And the idea that uh, telemedicine, at least I don't know about in Turkey, but at least in the US, literally made 10 years of progress in four weeks. All the technology existed, but the reason it wasn't pervasive was the insurance companies didn't uh, pay for it. Hospitals didn't implement it as their front facing approach. Doctors didn't really feel comfortable using it and patients didn't know about it. But when COVID hit and unless you had COVID, the last place in the world you wanted to go was a hospital. However, people still got sick and people still needed to see their doctor. And yet doctors' offices were closed. So doctors couldn't see patients in their offices. And so this technology that was available and had been part of this 25 year arc just clicked into gear because the incumbent dynamics uh, came apart. I'm gonna link this back to the why. In 2006, uh, we started Techstars. The reason we started Techstars was David Cohen had come up with this, one of the four co-founders had come up with this idea uh, to do Techstars, to create a mentor-driven accelerator, basically to fund 10 companies at a time over, you know, surround them with experienced entrepreneurs. So give them money, but also give them lots of help. Do it in a very focused way in Boulder, Colorado, and just see if it was a good idea. And the motivation for that was he had sold his company he had made some money. He was very unhappy with making angel investments. He'd done a few and it just wasn't satisfying. As an, as an entrepreneur himself, he's like, there's gotta be a better way at the very, very beginning of these companies to do more than just write a 25, 50 or hundred thousand dollar check. So when we, when we started it, we didn't have any idea if it was a good idea or not, but we had this notion that there might be a better way to do extremely early stage investing. Well, in 2006, seed and pre-seed pre investing hadn't been categorized yet. It wasn't happening. Seed investing was really hard to find because we were still dealing with the collapse of the internet bubble. And entrepreneurship was still subject to this cliche that if you were serious about starting a company, you had to go to the Bay Area. And I lived in Boulder, Colorado. I didn't believe that. I've been investing all over the US for many years. Um, I never lived in the Bay Area, even though I'd been there a lot and I'd done a lot of investments there. And we just sort of thought, nah, this is silly. Let's try this different thing. And if it doesn't work, our worst case is we'll learn from it. And so in that why, right, there's a very specific thing going on, which is there must be a better way to help companies get started. And, you know, Techstars has now invested in 2,500 companies around the world. We run 40 something accelerators each year. We invest in four to 500 companies. Uh, it has been part of democratizing entrepreneurship and innovation globally. And in 2020, if somebody said, well, if you're really serious about it, starting a company, you need to go to the Bay Area, it's not a credible statement anymore. No. So this sort of democratization of innovation has led us to another place in the midst of us having one of the most existential crises our species has had, certainly in a very long time. And the COVID crisis, I think, is gonna generate a number of things that are extremely difficult. You know, they're amplifying massive inequities uh, right now in our society um, globally. But what happens is that there is this sort of latent, uh, uh, sort of held back again by incumbent behavior forces of innovation and entrepreneurship, that a moment like this, those forces are unleashed again. And you know we've seen it happen multiple times. We saw it happen uh, for people not in the too distant past around the global financial crisis, right? In 2010, our whole economies globally were gonna fall apart, 2009, 2010. Every bank would be nationalized, businesses would, commerce would work totally differently. And what it did was it really, began an incredible decade long wave of innovation and entrepreneurship. Lots of people talk about, you know, like when's this gonna be over and has it hit its peak and that sort of thing. And I think it's the wrong kind of question because it's too focused on specific outcomes of individual things and not really foundationally addressing the notion that we're in this very, very rapidly evolving complex system and that entrepreneurship is a big part of the thing that causes stuff to change. And that's really the essence of my own why, which is I'm interested in this stuff because 
It's totally fascinating. I think it's at the core of how our species evolves quickly. It's not the only dimension on which we evolve as a species, but it's an important one. And it's one in which understanding what's going on globally and really, again, democratizing this phenomenon so anyone anywhere in the world can have access to it is much more interesting to me than simply aggregating a bigger pile of coins. And on the, like, okay, so, you know, I've, I've read, you know, I've read all of your books and I've read your columns and your blogs and the, the recurring theme over the last bit here, the last couple of years is the whole idea of democratizing entrepreneurship. And, you know, my question is, how do you democratize entrepreneurship globally? Because while we here in the States and Silicon Valley and Boulder and Austin and Boston and Seattle, we're used to it. The whole notion of entrepreneurship is so new. Once you get outside the, the parameters of the United States, it's if, you, if you're in Croatia, right? And no matter where I go in the world, your name always comes up. You know that because I always text you. Yeah, you're here. Here you are in Split, Croatia. Here you are in Pristina, Kosovo. I'm big. I'm big in. Can I'm big in Canada, right? <laughs> what, what, whatever yeah, that joke he's, is. He's everywhere. But the the question is, you know, it's like, and there's a lot of government money. I, I hope, by the way, somebody will adopt me if I ever have to leave the United States. Yeah, I know. I think <laughs> I can get you a sponsor in Iceland or in Estonia. Uh, yeah, we can't. We can't leave right now, but. But the whole concept of forced innovation is a real thing right now around the world. So governments are dropping all this money. So you've got like Station F in Paris. You've got all of these incubators and they are not as organic. And so the, the question is, how do you democratize entrepreneurship on a global scale? Yeah, so I think this is part of my motivation for writing the two books, Startup Communities and the Startup Community Way. And um, when I wrote Startup Communities in 2012, excuse me, it was a, uh, I wrote a very anecdotal book. It was not a story of Boulder, um, but, it, but it was anecdotal about how to build a startup community. It used Boulder as an example. And I tried to make it very simple and very clear. And I had four principles that, you know, I, I refer to as a Boulder thesis that I think today are fairly obvious and well understood by most entrepreneurs around the world, especially people working on startup communities. But in 2012, uh, we're not obvious and we're not normal for the way people thought about building startup communities and more importantly, entrepreneurial ecosystems because the phrase startup communities didn't even exist in 2012, yeah, yeah. right? So the book coined the phrase. And those four principles were the leaders have to be entrepreneurs. So this notion that you have to have a critical mass of leaders, uh, sorry, of entrepreneurs leading the activity. Um, I made some mistakes with that, by the way, and I come back to that if we want to say. Um, I classified everyone else as feeders. Uh, so all the people who weren't entrepreneurs played a feeder role. They supported the startup community. Import, very important role, but different. I've now introduced, a, this was one of the mistakes. I introduced a third category in the new book called instigator. Uh, so the feeders are really now organizations and the instigators are people who work for those organizations who play leadership roles. So the, the issue is separating people playing leadership roles from organizations who are playing feeder or support roles. The second principle, and I want people to hang on to this, is that you have to take a very long-term view. And I defined it then as a 20-year view. Today, I define it as a continuous 20-year view looking forward. So I've lived in Boulder 25 years. I'm on 25 years of my 45-year journey, not minus five years of my 25-year journey. You always have to have this long-term view looking forward. The third is that you have to be inclusive of anyone who wants to engage in the startup community at any level. And I use the word inclusive, you know, before it became popular uh, in technology and entrepreneurship to talk about inclusivity, diversity, equity, gender equity, racial equity, ethnicity, uh, age equity. I mean, these phenomena of just being inclusive, if somebody wants to participate, welcome them. Um, you know, there's no VP of membership. There's no VP of, there's no president of the startup community. You just want people to be part of it. And then the last is this idea of having continuous activities and events that engage people in entrepreneurship, not, you know, entrepreneur of the year awards. Sure, they're nice for people's egos, but they don't really do much. Um, cocktail parties at rich people's houses to do networking events. Sure, but 
you need to have things like accelerators, things like startup weekends, things like co-working spaces where there are endless activities and events for people to interact and intersect with each other. So, so that was the Boulder thesis in 2012. As I fast forward to 2020, one of the uh, phenomena that I've seen is this idea of uh, startup communities is now a global phenomenon. Uh, you know, it, it, it's very rewarding to me. It's very, you know, again, I use the word ego. My ego is very satisfied that uh, all around the world, people talk about startup communities and people are trying to do things. In that first book, I didn't talk about, okay, well, here's how to solve the problem of the startup community uh, challenges. I did have like, you know, here's some things that people do wrong and here's some problems. It's not a cookbook. It's not a, it's not a recipe, right? It's, it's, it's a sort of broader conceptual guide. The new book also is not a playbook because this is one of the key lessons I learned and that Ian Hathaway and I really try to weave through this new book is that a startup community is a complex adaptive system. And we shorten that phrase to a complex system uh, to, to just make it less ponderous. Let me define for people what a complex system is with an example. I'm gonna define three types of systems, simple, complicated, and complex. A simple system is making a cup of coffee. You put beans in, you run a short recipe, short process, you get coffee out. It's got a deterministic outcome. There's different steps. You can put milk or sugar, you can use different beans, they're different coffee makers, but it's a pretty straightforward process. Coffee might not be any good, but it's still coffee. So beginning and recipe deterministic system. A complicated system is doing your monthly financial statements. Lots more steps, different order, sometimes different inputs, but still a deterministic ending. You get your balance sheet, income statement, uh, cash flow statement, beginning and deterministic process. A complex system is raising a child. And everyone here has either been a child or has children. And if the day the child is born, uh, the parents say, when you are 25 years old, here's how you will dress. This is what you will eat. This is what you will be interested in. Here's who your partner will be. This is where you will live. These are the things that you will do each. Like all you're doing is setting that child up for lots of therapy. You can't, there's no recipe. There's no deterministic outcome. You can't say for the next 25 years, these are the steps. The inputs that you give that child generate outputs that generate new inputs, and it evolves in very unpredictable ways. That's a startup community. And so the big message is that you can't control what's going on. You can't say, this is my outcome. Uh, second corollary to that that's really important is as a result, you can't have a top-down phenomena. You can't say, from the top down, these are the things we're going to do to generate the outcome that is a successful startup community. Right. Even if you could define what a successful startup community is, because that means something different everywhere. Right. It's a bottom up phenomenon where people start engaging and as you engage, different things start emerging and the language of complexity feeds into this. And you know, I won't torture us in this call with the language of complexity, but I'll give a few words so people can hang on to it, which is sort of how we've, we've used the book uh, to define how startup communities work, the new book. Uh, nonlinear outcomes or nonlinear systems. You know, if you take a nonlinear curve, a curve that looks like this, right, versus a line, so many things in our world are geometric curves. However, as a human being, if you scale in or your time horizon is short enough, that curve looks like a line because you see a little tiny segment of it. So you think it's linear, but in fact, it's a curve like that. Contagion would be an example of language from complexity theory that we can all relate to. COVID is a great example of, the spread of COVID is a great example of ne negative contagion. Um, when you have a few cases day by day, the number of cases increase, it doesn't feel like it's that heavy until you get into you know day, 20 or 21 or 22, if you're not trying to mitigate the spread and all of a sudden you realize that you've got an exponential curve and it's expanding incredibly quickly, which is what we saw in the spring, what we saw again in the early summer. And probably what we're gonna see around the world is temperatures get cooler in the winter again and people can't be outdoors as much. Um, uh, 
By the way, the second order effect is more scary than the first order effect. The spread and the number of people that have COVID is much less of a problem than the number of people who, who end up in the hospital relative to COVID because there's a finite number of hospital beds. There's a finite number of ICU beds. And once you've filled up the hospitals in a geography, now you're in a crisis. And that's what happened in you know, Italy. That's what happened in uh, different parts of Europe. That's what happened in uh, New York and in places on the East Coast in the US at the beginning of the crisis. Yeah, the acceleration of the disease was awful. But once the hospital systems got overwhelmed, you had another type of contagion phenomena, which is you now couldn't do anything. You had to triage people. You can have other phenomena like what's called a phase shift or a phase transformation. Things look a certain way until then suddenly they don't. They look totally different. A positive example of this would be exits that happen in a startup community. I'll use Boulder as the example here. Um, Boulder's only 100,000 people, small town. So when you know my book came out in 2012 and uh, you know, I've been talking about lots of stuff around tech stars for the preceding couple of years. Lots of people say, that's cool. You know, Boulder's cool, but it's small. Like it's never going to support any really big successful companies. And in 12 months between 2013 and 2014, uh, two companies went public, Zayo and Rally Software. Zayo recently went private for $14 billion. So very large, very significant company. Rally ultimately got bought by a company called CA. And a third company, Data Logics, got bought by Oracle for $1.2 billion, when $1.2 billion was a big number for an acquisition. We had a phase transformation. The day before the first of those deals happened, people were still saying Boulder is cute, <laughs> right? It's Brad, it's cute. But after that third company had its exit, nobody ever says that anymore. And subsequently, numerous companies have emerged from the Boulder startup community, they're really significant companies, including some, you know, like SendGrid that, you know, now is part of Twilio, but had a multi-billion dollar IPO and was a company that went through Techstars early. So when you're in a geography somewhere else in the world and somebody says, oh, we haven't had exits here yet, so we're not successful. I want to just point people back to that long-term view. And let and me just ask you real quick. <laughs> While, while we're on this topic, and I don't want your eyes to glaze over because it's the P word, and I know how you feel about policy, but wherever I go around the world, what tends to happen with these ecosystems and this, you know, the whole notion of the startup way is that governments want to put policy on everything, right? And so founders and startups trip they fall over these obstacles. Like policy is a real buzzkill, and yet you know, there are certain policies that are good. Like maybe if we had better policies here in this country, COVID would be a little bit more contained or I would be paid, you know, a, a dollar for a dollar, not 75 cents to a male dollar, right? So I just kind of want to get your perspective on that. I mean, I hate policy. I don't like talking about it, but it's something that comes up no matter where I am or where I'm Zooming. And I think your perspective is really, really important. Yeah, so um, let me separate policy into three layers of government, um, local or city level government, state level government, where a state is an, an analog of a US state, and then country level government. And so really our national government, most, most governments have two to three layers like that, that engage with the startup community. And um, I used to punt on it. I, I used to not really try to understand it and address it for two reasons. One was Boulder city government is at best neutral to entrepreneurship and probably hostile to entrepreneurship. Boulder is a town that has a very strong no growth faction, mm -hmm. people that don't wanna see any growth. Um, it's got uh, a lot of challenges around building and development and construction and density. And that then generates lots of other issues. But my own experience in Boulder around entrepreneurship with city government is that city government really hasn't done anything positive or negative. Like it's kind of a parallel universe to what's going on. So I, I come from that frame of reference. State government in Colorado is different. State government has actually been pretty productive around entrepreneurship going back you know, 20 years. 
Um, and when I say productive, uh, you know, I put it in the category of at best do no harm. Right. And so you kind of want to start with do no harm. And then to the extent that there are specific things that government is doing that's additive and helpful, uh, that's good. Those kinds of things generally have a lot more to do with providing uh, support, uh, some allocation of capital, uh, consistency in laws, uh, especially around rule of law, uh, consistency around equity so that you don't have corruption, you don't have disadvantages, you don't have these phenomena uh, you know, that play out over and over again in a way uh, that benefits some but inhibit others, which by the way, in the US is a real problem mm -hmm. that we now really understand, especially around racial equity um, at state levels throughout the country. And then at a federal level, same kind of things. There's specific things that federal or national governments can do. The mistake that governments make is they try to control or dictate what's going on. Right. And that just doesn't work. Right. And some of it is through regulatory activities, especially as companies become powerful and successful. Some of it is through taxation. Some of it is through different kinds of uh, advantaging some types of businesses over others. Those things generally are either separate from or not helpful uh, in the context of startups. And you know we're seeing it play out in a big way right now in the US with antitrust. Uh, and you know we're starting to see it in, uh, we see it in Europe all the time with antitrust with, with big technology companies. We're seeing it in the trade war between uh, China and the US where companies are being used basically as pawns in a trade war between governments. And I'd say there's two phenomena going on. One is one that's very complex and challenging for the companies. And one that companies are just completely ignoring on, on another dimension. And so uh, a very wise friend of mine, attorney general of Colorado, a guy named Phil Weiser, uh, once said that the law, the law lags behind technological innovation. And so I think what ends up happening is the bottom-up phenomena of entrepreneurship, the dynamics and power of entrepreneurs, um, the momentum of things when you get these positive feedback loops tend to leverage the positive benefits uh, of government without necessarily being suppressed in general by the neutral, but occasionally harmed Right. by the negative. And so there are places in the world where it's been very, very challenging. A book that's, a, just I'll end with this, a book that's a great one to read if people are interested, uh, that you know, has, uh, you know, has adjacencies to, to uh, the Turkish geography is a book called um, Startup Rising uh, by Christopher Schroeder. Some people yeah. may know this book. Chris, Chris is a magnificent thinker world traveler. He wrote this book around 2012, around the same time that I wrote Startup uh, Communities. And in my own experience, is probably the, the broadest traveled American investing in entrepreneurship around the globe. And in this book, what you read is so many things that are happening in 2012 in places throughout uh, MENA and the Middle East, in spite of government, rather than because of government. Yeah. And yeah. I think that's an important thing to carry around. It's not, uh, it's not um, uh, uh, anarchistic. It's not an effort to undermine or eliminate government. It's just, you know what? Government is gonna be what it is. We're gonna do this because this is innovation. This is entrepreneurship. And when we do something good, the government will eventually catch up. Do you wanna hear one of the stranger policy discussions I have ever heard? Sure, I'd love to. Okay, so I was in Istanbul. Barack, I hope I don't end up in a Turkish gulag for telling this story. Um, but Erdogan was speaking at the Global Entrepreneurship Network Conference. And I mean, he was literally 10 feet in front of me. And he was on his shtick about how entrepreneurship will, you know, pull Turkey out of the, the doldrums economically. And he said, and I, this is not a direct quote, but it is in concept uh, verbatim. He said, uh, the only way we in Turkey 
more specifically Istanbul, the only way we can create these, these powerful global entrepreneurial ecosystems is if families have more than four children, right? So his solution was, let's have babies, right? I mean, I looked around, I'm like, am, am I in 1930? Anyway, that's my Erdogan story. And I know we're running out of time and I know there's a lot of questions, but I wanted to, like my last question for you, Brad, like everybody knows that you are um, a, a very pivotal figure in, in entrepreneurship, not only you know in Boulder and Austin and in the United States, but globally, I mean, you're a force. Um, and I think one of the things people don't know about you, but one of the things that I do is that you have had such an incredible impact with your rawness and authenticity about mental health. And I feel like right now, you know, the entrepreneurs and founders that I'm talking to around the world, you know, they're, they're suffering, right? And it's, it's, there's a stigma attached to mental health, you know, for founders, especially outside of the United States because it is associated with failure. And unlike the United States, failure is not um, embraced the way we embrace it here. And so, you know, I'm sorry, something is popping up. I just wondered if you could talk a little bit about mental health and how you have overcome your challenges and your demons. Because for those of you who don't know, Brad Feld has been out there advocating um, for mental health care and mental health awareness for years. Well, I'll start with my, my why again in the context of this is that I had a six month depressive episode in 2013. Um, you know, if from the outside looking in of my life, you'd say, wow, that guy's got a great life, right? Married to an amazing woman, uh, uh, my wife, Amy Bachelor, super great relationship. My businesses uh, were doing great. Foundry Group's been extremely successful in 2013. We, you know, on a, on a great positive curve, Techstars was growing very quickly. I lived in a magnificent place, Boulder, Colorado. I was in very, very good physical shape. I had run a 50 mile run, uh, a race uh, uh, in 2012. And um, I had this very intense depressive episode. Um, I've had multiple of them as an adult. I've struggled with anxiety since I was probably a teenager. Um, um, I have a clinical diagnosis uh, of obsessive compulsive disorder. Um, I've done plenty of therapy, I've taken medication, I've worked hard on myself to navigate my own, uh, my own issues. Uh, in, uh, in my 20s, when I had my first major depressive episode while running a business, which lasted for two years, I was very functional in a work context when I was depressed. But like, that's all I could do. Nothing else mattered in my life. Like I'd have to put all my energy into getting out of bed in the morning. I'd, I'd be productive and have a good, strong eight to 10 hour day. I couldn't work 14, 18 hours a day. But I'd sort of grind through my day and I'd come home, I'd lay on the couch and stare at the ceiling, you know, or sit in the bathtub for two hours and then eventually lay in bed for hours and not be able to fall asleep because when you're depressed, it's hard to sleep. So in this later phase, when I was in my late 40s and I had this out of the blue depressive episode, I had a very different internal reaction than I had in my 20s and then my 30s when I had depressive episodes. Um, in my 20s, I was incredibly ashamed. I was ashamed that I was depressed. I was ashamed that I was a leader. I was ashamed to tell anybody about it. I was ashamed that I took medication. I was ashamed that I saw a psychiatrist. Uh, I was ashamed about how I feel. I felt all the time, just continually and endlessly ashamed. In my 40s, uh, when I got depressed, the year before several well-known entrepreneurs had committed suicide and they committed suicide sort of out of the blue. And you know, one of them was, uh, chronically depressed. One of them was probably bipolar. Um, so sort of manic, people thought he was doing great and everything was awesome, but his business was about to go out of business and he just saw no way out. Um, and then another one, I didn't know the person personally, but I, so their story was a little more mysterious, but all, you know, again, successful, uh, successful high visibility figures um, who clearly were struggling under the weight of this stigma and, and the only way out for them was suicide. So my why became eliminating the stigma associated with mental health. Um, I view mental health as just another part of health, no different than physical health. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and some people live with chronic diseases like diabetes uh, and they manage and navigate their diabetes their whole life uh, and they're still completely successful and productive. 
Cancer, which you know used to be a death sentence, is now a disease that many people survive. But there was a period of time, even when I was growing up, where if somebody had cancer, ooh, you know, you stayed away from them. You didn't know. Um, I'm a. Uh, I was in my uh, late teens, early twenties when HIV uh, became visible, and in my college years, like you know, HIV was something that was so unknown that uh, it was it was a death sentence for people, and, and HIV and AIDS was was terrifying. So kind of my view, and today it's manageable. I have a very close friend from college that's hemophiliac that had HIV that's still alive today. So kind of my, my own internal view became the value of eliminating the stigma as part of my own mission on this planet. And then when I apply it to entrepreneurship, look, this stuff is super hard. It is. It, you know, it gets fucked up all the time. Um, you have a great day and then you have an awful day. <laughs> Yeah, you have, yeah. you know, things that you think are going to go a certain way, and then they just don't. Uh, you have conflicts with your best friend who happens to be your co co partner. You have a, an investor who all of a sudden turns on you. You have a competitor that comes out of nowhere with a product that's way better than yours, and all of a sudden you're in distress. You have some kind of crisis that goes on inside your company that you didn't see coming. You have some external effect, COVID that you, know, you couldn't have anticipated. It's totally exogenous. It has massive impact on you, on and on and on and on and on. And so as I've gotten older, what I realize is as humans, uh, we are just big bags of chemicals and we all have different chemicals and the chemicals interact in different ways. And taking care of ourself is so incredibly important in the journey through life and most entrepreneurs neglect themselves in the context of their business. And when I say take care of yourself, I'm not being cliche and, and prescribing what you should do. And I think for many people, it's going on your own journey and learning about yourself uh, and learning about your strengths and your weaknesses because so much of our positive and negative programming comes from our childhood and comes from our environment. And as adults, so many of us ignore that and allow that to be negative reinforcement of our life. And then that plays out on everybody around us. If you want a book to read about this, that's one of the best books, I think, uh, on the planet. It's by a guy named Jerry Colonna, who's an extremely close friend, called Reboot, The Art of Leadership and Growing Up. And it's a beautiful book because it's part memoir, part philosophy, part practical guidebook, right? So you sort of get all of those in one. And it, you know, it's written in the same kind of style if you read Startup Communities that Startup Communities has. I think it's, I think Jerry wrote, it's his first book, but I think it's a better, well, better written than Startup Communities. And you read through it, it doesn't say here's the answer. It says, you know what? Give yourself a break. Right. It's, it's just going to be hard. And by the way, again, independent of what your uh, religious beliefs are, we all know that life ends. Um, I had a friend die several weeks ago. I have another extremely close friend. I talked to him yesterday. It's one of my closest friends. You know, he's, uh, he's at very end of life. He's had an incredible life, uh, enormous impact on me, probably only second uh, to my uh, to my father in terms of impact from men in my life, and you know it's it's hard like it's hard we have to process that as humans and that's just part of the experience and so in the context of that being in denial about the reality of our own mental health and how that affects us what we can do about it and how that affects others as well as how others are doing around me and the fact that their stressors are impacting them uh, is something to be super awareness of. I'm gonna end with one example. There's a spectrum in the time of COVID when people are in their houses and isolated. At one end of the spectrum is the extrovert who is in incredible, incredible duress because it's just not their way to be sitting in their house all the time. And imagine the extrovert that's alone that doesn't have a spouse, doesn't have kids. Or think about the person that has a spouse and has kids, but kind of is like two or three hours a day is what they can handle 
of their spouse and kids and they need <laughs> time with others for the rest of their time. Yeah. And they're stuck in that house. That's one end of the spectrum. The other end of the spectrum, and I'll put me on it, is somebody who doesn't have kids, who is perfectly happy never to get on a plane, never to travel, to do everything by video. Because for 25 years of my life, I traveled Monday to Friday. I never got to spend time except for the weekends when I was worn out with the person I was put on this planet to be with, which is my wife, Amy. And now I get to spend all my time with her. Yeah, we work. She was working, you know, she had a conference call before this. I went for a run. But after this, and I have one more call, we'll go have lunch together. And then we'll both work this afternoon. And then this evening, we'll have the evening together, whatever we decide to do. I'm at the other end of the spectrum. And people are on this spectrum. So however you're doing and however you're handling this moment, Think about everybody that's on the spectrum that you're interacting with that may be handling it differently than you. Right. And as a leader, as an entrepreneur, being tuned into those things and trying to make it easier in the context of your business to create positive social dynamics rather than inhibiting a negative social dynamics will help all those people in meaningful ways. So I'll just sort of end with that. Like, it's not just about you, but it's about you as a leader and an entrepreneur and the people around you and how they're interacting with everything in this moment. Yeah, and it's, you know, I, what you were saying earlier about, you know, the, the path to entrepreneurship and to founding something, it is hard. And we in the media tend to glamorize it. Right, like we, we create this big facade of you know these successful founders, but most people fail, and you know as during this COVID thing, people are struggling. Founders are struggling, trying to find their way, and there's this whole mental health component, and it's a global. It's not just in the United States, um, and so your words I think are very very meaningful, and I think that you're the the way you are looking at it, you know, in a future way, and that long tail is that you know even though it's really really hard and you may not reap the rewards of, of the hard work and the sweat equity. I mean, what, what we are doing as, as creators and as entrepreneurs is we're laying the foundation for the future and for opportunities and industries and new ways of, of seeing. And um, I know that there, there are a ton of questions for you, Brad, but I just, you know, I wanna say this on this global stage, the work that you have done, we are all grateful for, and we are better people Thanks, um, for your for your honesty. So, Brock, I brought my wrong glasses. So, if you wouldn't mind reading the questions, <laughs> just a second. So, the first question is uh, from Eric. Uh, keeping in mind uh, uh, your point about how do we even rate startup communities? Any particular global startup communities that you see? have got the right mix of policies, uh, integrators, feeders, Israel, India, Singapore? So this is, Eric, it's a, it's a powerful and important question. We have a chapter in the book, uh, chapter 11, called The Measurement Trap. And uh, as humans uh, and as business people, we're programmed to measure everything and compare ourselves and rate ourselves against everything. And in the context of startup communities, it's actually an inhibiting phenomenon because we measure the easy things, not the important things. Mm -hmm. The easy things to measure are things like number of companies, number of founders, number of exits, number of unicorns, amount of funding, things like that. But really what's important is not the parts, but the interaction between the parts. And it's really hard to measure that it's even harder to measure the value of the interaction between the parts. And so what you can do though, is instead of trying to rate and compare, you look at other startup communities for things that are working and you try to learn from those things and then adapt those things back to your startup community. Um, and there are great examples from all over the world and lots of different kinds of startup communities. Um, one of the things I think that's so interesting is this idea of playing a positive sum game, which is one where there's not a winner and a loser. If you think about politics, there's a winner and a loser in an election. If you think about sports, ultimately in all sports, there's a winner and a loser. I guess some sports like hockey or soccer, 
you can tie an individual game, but at the end of the season, there's a winner and a loser. Um, that is not the case with entrepreneurship and with startup communities. You can have many, many things that succeed that have positive impact on many other things that succeed. Um, so I just, I reframe it to focus on that. Um, because you asked about specific countries, there's a great, uh, another great book, I'm a huge reader, uh, another great book called Startup Nation uh, that talks about the story of uh, the startup community's growth in Israel. I don't remember when it was written. I feel like it was written around 2000. So it, well before Startup Communities was written. Um, and it's a really, really powerful book that talks about some very simple and foundational things that were done in Israel in the 80s and 90s uh, that had enormous impact on entrepreneurship but also the characteristic of the country, especially around uh, the, Israel's own resources, specifically the in, uh, uh, intellectual uh, and functional resources around the military because of how Israel is positioned in the Middle East that generated enormous amount of skills for industry segments like cybersecurity. And as a result, generated huge waves of innovation in emerging areas that played to the strengths of people that were going to naturally be entrepreneurs in Israel. So it's not that that's, again, a playbook for other countries, but you can look inside your country and say, okay, what are some of the strengths we have naturally because of the characteristics of our society? And how can we build the types of companies off of those characteristics? Uh, I have also a, questions, uh, a question about the book, uh, a chapter, Build Your Strengths. Historic, history and local context are fundamental to complex systems. You cannot recreate Silicon Valley, which is uh, one reason why uh, we often say, don't try to uh, be a Silicon Valley. Every startup community should focus on being the best version of itself. Should you a little bit explain uh, what do you mean uh, with that? Sure. So... We went through a wave around the internet bubble where everybody was starting to talk about, uh, you know, labeling their city Silicon something, right? In the U.S., uh, New York became Silicon Alley, Los Angeles became Silicon Beach, Utah became Silicon Slopes because of the ski slopes, and on and on and on. And I thought that was just stupid. Um, uh, and my, my feedback to people was, you already have a brand. It's called the name of your city or your state or your country. So talk about the Boulder startup community or the Colorado startup community or the Istanbul startup community. And then go a step deeper. Istanbul was once a startup. And Istanbul has a much longer and richer history than uh, Boulder, Colorado does uh, as a city. Um, you know, Colorado obviously has a very, very long history, but Boulder as a city is a relatively young city. It's 150 years old or something like that. So go back thousands of years and thinking about what the history of Istanbul is. Think about what the natural resources are in Istanbul. Why do people uh, view Istanbul as an important place to be on this planet? What are the things about Istanbul that you want more of and that you want to amplify? What are the cultural resources that you have? In the book, we have a section called the seven capitals. And we wrote that section because everyone that I know everywhere around the world says, well, in my startup community, there's not enough capital. And what they really mean is there's not enough money, which by the way, is almost never true because there's lots of wealthy people and lots of money. And there are a few places in the world where this is true. But in many, many parts of the world, there is an enormous amount of wealth, even if it's concentrated or not well distributed. So there is financial capital. It may just not, it may simply not know how to invest in startups and entrepreneurship. But financial capital is one of seven types of capital. You have intellectual capital, you have network capital, you have cultural capital and on and on, infrastructure capital, and one of the magic tricks in a startup community is to concentrate on building on the capital that you have, which then attracts the capital that you don't have versus spend all of your time and energy trying to get the capital that you don't have. 
by the way, it's one of the classic mistakes if you just want to tie back to policy and government uh, that government makes over and over again. If we just had more money here, everything would be great. Well, great, now you have more money, but nobody actually knows how to build or scale a company. And you don't have the right kind of intellectual capital around the domains that you need. And you don't have the right kind of network capital uh, to get people connected to each other. And you don't have the right kind of cultural capital to make the place you have an attractive place for people to move to, to then go start companies or to work in companies, dot, 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 dot. Right, so that's what I mean. Like focus on Istanbul, focus on what is great about the place you live and why you love it. I'll give you one more word today. A word, the word is topophilia. And that word is throughout the book. I learned it from, gov uh, from our, our governor in Colorado, uh, John Hickenlooper. He's now, uh, uh, he was governor until 2018. John was a very successful entrepreneur. Um, if you ever come to the US and you drink a microbrew or a craft beer, uh, he was one of the founders of the microbrewery industry in the U.S. And topophilia means love of place. And uh, that word, love of place, is so powerful. I mean, if you are living in Istanbul because you love Istanbul, because you have topophilia for where you are, that is a very powerful why. And I would say to people, if you don't have topophilia for where you live, why do you live there? And some people have good reasons. My elder parents, uh, I feel like I'm trapped here. I don't have the resource to move somewhere else. Those are reasonable reasons. And I try to orient people when they say, I wanna get involved in startups, to develop topophilia for the place they're in as a way of identifying things that they can build off of in the place they're in. So there are many questions, but we have very limited time. So I'm going to uh, sum up uh, the last question. Currently is a pandemic time. And sometimes uh, the problem uh, that we have got problem is not having the product not to sell, but we cannot test it. I mean, they have the product, but they cannot test it. Since we are on research and development sector. So uh, what is the B plan? What do you uh, recommend these kinds of startups? They ask this question. Well, it's hard to answer generically. My generic answer is uh, to try to be as creative as you can about actually figuring out ways to test your product. We're investors in many companies that make physical products, hardware companies. And I would say uh, at, in the first month of COVID, there was a ton of fear around the physical product companies, software companies less so because physical product companies in terms of product development, product design, early testing, getting in the hands of users, just the logistics of the supply chains, all this sort of stuff. And all of our companies have navigated that. It's been challenging. And many of them have had to be very creative uh, around how to get product into people's hands uh, to get feedback. Um, but one of the things that they've all figured out and that they've all done is they've eliminated uh, the need to be in person. They use uh, uh, video uh, uh, and cameras, uh, not just on the computer, but also sort of in the home that they ship to people to test, uh, especially when they're testing products. Big industrial products are harder because you know if you have to have a big industrial product that gets installed in an industrial facility. And so those uh, companies are doing things like doing installations in secured environments, very safe, secured environments that they have control over. And then again, using video to have users that are not in those controlled environments see what's going on and have an operator of the machine uh, interact with the machine while the remote tester is giving them directions and then giving them feedback. It's more ponderous. But it's interesting. And as people get better at it, um, it's actually a real advantage because you start to learn how to do a much more rapid iteration of testing of things and user feedback without having to get product into users' hands or users in front of you and move people around. You're moving stuff around or you're using video and video conferencing to really engage people. So that's my best effort at a generic answer. Um, I just, I'll give a specific answer. We have a company called Formlabs 
uh, which is based in Boston, 3D printing company. They've just shipped two new products, one called the Form 3L, which is a very large build size for their traditional 3D printer um, uh, that uses a technology called SLA. It's, you know, they're the market leader in desktop SLA. And they, you know, they went from a build volume of about this to a build volume about this, so you can build very large parts. But they also came out with a new product called SLS, which is a ten to twenty thousand dollar machine that replaces a quarter of a million, two hundred fifty thousand dollar industrial product. And it doesn't need to be in a in a in a lab environment. It can be it, uh, they call it a tabletop because it's big. It's too big to be on the side of your desk, but it can be next to your desk. And like just watching them, it's manufactured in, in a facility uh, in China. Uh, their customers, um, uh, you know, are all over the world. And just watching the amount of video that they're using to help sell uh, to, you know, we, they just started shipping production units this week. So going through the whole early test cycle, like, again, being creative and, and recognizing that what you're doing could be long term you could be doing something that significantly improves the quality of your business over a long period of time versus just in this moment. Uh, thank you very much for, uh, I mean, Brad, um, the last questions answer and also this an hour long conversation with Amy. Amy, also very th thank you very much for also making this fireside to, to make it happen. Uh, and uh, I wish you a great day in uh, Colorado and hope the fire for forest uh, thank will thank you. off soon. <laughs> and you. thank you very much for entrepreneurs today and uh, hope to meet in our next uh, meetings. Thank you very much. Stay safe and healthy. Bye. All right. Thanks thank you for, for hosting, Amy. Great to see you. Everybody yeah. be safe and healthy. And uh, thank you for having me. Cheers, you guys. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.